Uh, just a word about internal and external traceability uh, because there are it's another way of classifying your traceability systems. Internal traceability is when I as a business operator I put a code on my product and I pass that product to my customer. My customer can see that code, can read the code but doesn't know what it means. Okay, because in that code I have embodied certain data about that product which allows me to identify suppliers, dates, uh, process variables which might be of interest to, to me to be able to properly identify uh, <coughs> which line it was working on, which shift and so on. So I put all of that in my coding system but anybody outside who reads that doesn't know necessarily what it means. So all of my batch identifiers are, <coughs> are publicly available but the metadata which allows people to read it is, is, or interpret that data is not, uh, is not publicly available. So when you look at a product like uh, uh, one I have here, I think. Yeah. So canned products often have this data on them. Uh, you can see there is a whole coding system there written on the can, but you don't know necessarily what what those codes mean. Uh, <coughs> however, there are also external traceability systems uh, where all traceable items are uniquely identified in the sense that uh, there is a standardized system for defining suppliers, uh, defining the uh, uh, operator, defining the product and, and so on. And all of that information is shared between all of the participants in the supply chain. So if you're at the end of the supply chain, if you're say a retailer, you can know which of various suppliers uh, that product came from and you can also see which of their suppliers also uh, were uh, supplying them and that information is all available to you. So sitting at the receiving end you have at your fingertips all of the information uh, about the entire supply chain in the products which which have uh, uh, arrived in your uh, into your possession. And that requires a standardized approach means that all operators will need to adopt a similar standardized system with identical uh, coding uh, variables. So these are often imposed by supermarkets and there are in fact international standards which uh, are developed for expressing this uh, information. Uh, I'll show you in, in a moment. Uh, so this is a, an example of a uh, similar to the can which we're handing around. Uh, this is the data which we found on the end of a can of tuna. And this is uh, written onto it by the business operator. And okay, you can see some things you might recognize. Ghana, well, it, it would be a fair assumption that it was produced in Ghana. December 2018, uh, probably a best before date. But as far as all these other letters and numbers, we don't know what it means unless you have the coding system. Uh, so, as it happens, we have the coding system which is used by the business operator to identify a whole range of different variables. So they can identify the species, the processing factory which was 
uh, which this was processed in, and the year when it was processed, and the day of that year. So this would be day 269 of 2013. Best before end date, yeah. This identifies the seamer, in other words the machine which actually closed the can, the hour and the shift uh, uh, which was uh, which processed it, the style of the product uh, and the medium, whether it's sunflower oil or of olive oil. Uh, then they have here a code which identifies the fishing method, the year of the catch and the vessel. Okay, so they can and which trip number. So it's not just the vessel but which trip. And the vessel records will have trip one was from this date to that date and they'll have daily catch records and things like that. Uh, so this only goes down to the trip number. Okay, country we know. And then the time on this shift when the can was sealed. Okay, so quite a lot of detailed data. And on that can that's going round, there will be similar data within that code on that can, but we don't know what it means because Bruns Cosmo told me what their coding was so I can read this, but I don't know what Brunswick Sardines uh, uh, coding system is. Okay. So that's uh, an example of an internal uh, traceability system. And certainly as inspectors, uh, we have a right to ask business operators to share with us their uh, traceability coding system so that we can read this data and uh, uh, understand whether or not they have made sufficient uh, 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 steps to properly uh, ensure traceability of their, of their product. Okay, so one of the things we need to be asking is what is your coding system and what does it mean? Yeah, so Stammer. It's necessary or by regulation to have some time to see a code on a product and it does, you can't even decipher what it means if it's a date. And I think sometimes it looks like a date. You just see digits so you might see figures, alphabet mm -hmm. figures and Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, if it is a manufacturer, uh, if, if it is the manufacturer that has applied the code, there is no obligation to, to provide data on interpretation to, to the public or generally. Uh, but they should be able to provide that on request of a customer or a competent authority in the case of a, a, a food safety query. Um, as I say, these, are, these internal traceability systems are the, the information, the data is, is private to the operator. You know, if, if I'm uh, Cosmo Fish Cannery or Pioneer Fish Cannery, whoever produced this, I don't want uh, anybody in the world to know about which vessels I'm working with and uh, which trip they caught product in. You know, these are things which could be used by my competitors to uh, gain an advantage over me. So that's why people use the codes rather than, you know, writing the information per se. Uh, but in case of a recall or withdrawal, there should be a right of the appropriate competent authority to demand that information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ernie. Assuming in that case we have had that experience in terms of decoding information. Yeah. Uh, many brands will carry their own codes, they have in their dates, and some of them will use uh, 
the day of the year and so on. But in countries like Canada, regulations specify that you must have fixed day, month, and year. And um, I think our standards had also done that. But the difficulty of back then with small states, small countries, sometimes what you are, your, the order you are making in terms of the product that you are importing, the factories is not adequate to alter the operations in a factory to have you to put the date as specified by your legislation. So they will say to you, it's whether you, you buy it or you live it. Because you are not a market that's large enough. Uh, the equipment will cost us a couple million dollars to reshape our factory to yeah. make it wow. a particular date that your legislation specifies. So we also have that issue. But in many of the cases where you have, we are speaking here basically, which is different from this, this is traceability. Yeah. But we are looking at production and expiry dates. Um, things that the customer need to make an informed decision as to the best buy date or, or um, expiry date yeah. of this product. The, the that, that information is, is different. That, that is a labeling requirement where certain products may be required to put on uh, consume by or best before end of dates. Uh, and that's a completely different issue to this. Uh, I mean, incidentally, when I started as an environmental health officer, it was not an offence to sell food beyond the dates marked on the pack, whether it was a best before end date or consumed by. Uh, and that was only brought in later on. And to be honest, I'm not sure that these have much relevance from a food safety point of view anyhow you know because they're, they're often applied by manufacturers based on quality consideration so the manufacturer says uh, what is the uh, minimum quality with which we would wish consumers to consume our product in terms of deterioration of flavor or color or texture and, and so on and that is what determines the, the date which I put on the pack in terms of consume by, not the limits of food safety so that, you know, at one minute to midnight this product is somehow safe and at one minute past midnight somehow it becomes unsafe. Uh, so these are, I mean, I'm I know we say now, most jurisdictions say uh, certainly a consume by date should, food <coughs> should not be uh, marketed after that date. But it doesn't mean that it out, out of date product is actually uh, unsafe. And when it comes to best before, best before dates, these are clearly advisory. <coughs> you know, they're not intended to be a statutory measure. So uh, I would advise some caution in the way that these things are applied. This has also been looked at in many instances because what is being claimed is that because of the way the best before dates, expiry dates and so on, um, the way it's interpreted and it's been used, <coughs> it provides for massive wastage of food. Yeah. Perfectly good food. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Um, given the quantity of food they say by the, the world population, the increasing in the population and the ability to be able to provide food. Yeah. Um, no, no, you're quite right. <laughs> and, and it is a scandal, it is a scandal that many supermarkets uh, now, a very significant proportion of the food which they receive and display is removed from display at the end of its shelf life and, and destroyed. And it's perfectly fit for human consumption. Uh, it's just reached the, uh, the sell-by date. Uh, and okay, it may not be absolutely premium quality in terms of flavor or texture, but, but it's perfectly fit and perfectly reasonable to be consumed. So, and 
and actually there's a lot of misunderstanding. I even get asked quite often by inspectors and competent authorities, well what is, you know, what shelf life should we require on this, on these different products? And of course it all depends on the storage conditions, on the variables surrounding the process, on time and temperature and so on. And it, you cannot be rigorous about these things. And uh, it is very much up to the uh, uh, producer to determine these uh, periods during which they think uh, the product should be consumed. <coughs> so, in terms of costs and benefits, uh, as you can imagine, setting up traceability systems is not cheap. It involves business operators to change their practices in some ways. Uh, at the very simplest, it requires additional record keeping. So it's time consuming. The buyer and the seller have to sit down and record their transaction on a piece of paper at a minimum. Uh, but often it means also if you have even a moderately sophisticated business operation that you might need extra time or extra people to be able to uh, gather and maintain this data. So we might have to recruit and train our staff. Also, if we are going to be trying to maintain the integrity of batches of raw material which are moving through our processing or through our storage uh, operations, uh, in order to maintain that separation of batches, uh, we will automatically reduce the efficiency of our, our operations. It might mean, for example, that we have to finish processing one batch and get that through our process line before we introduce the new batch so they're not mixed up at some stage of the process. Or it may mean that we would have to have some means of separating. So you often find things like different color-coded boxes or plastic tags to separate batches in a process line. But all of this requires some time and effort and it slows things down. If we are uh, also uh, storing our products, our raw material, or our final product often have to be stored for a period uh, within our establishment. If we are going to keep different batches separate, uh, it means that we need more space. Before we might just pile things on a pallet, mixing batches up, but now we have to use three separate pallets because we keep batch A separate from batch B, separate from batch C, so we need more space. So this also introduces costs to the business operator. And then also we need to invest sometimes in, a, in the traceability system itself, in building a database, in having computers and software and so on uh, to be able to uh, 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 retain and, and uh, retrieve the data when we, when we need to do it. Uh, however, on the other side, there are benefits. It's not just uh, all bad. Uh, the most important benefit is that to the business operator as well as to the competent authority is that damage from food safety incidents can be limited because we actually focus our withdrawal and recall on the products which are affected and no more. So you can imagine if you have a system in which there is no traceability and you identify a food safety uh, uh, problem within a batch, well the batch is defined as everything that came to you, not just that batch which is uh, uh, 
defined by certain code numbers and so on. And so you can only uh, take action against the wider quantities. So the losses on the food safety operator are much, much greater. Uh, I, I had an incident a, a few years ago which I was called to in Portugal and uh, there were five containers of frozen yellow fin tuna which had come from a, uh, a fishing business in South Africa to a Portuguese tuna cannery and as part of their routine raw material checks this cannery had found that some of the tuna had very high levels of histamine, uh, 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. That would obviously been a major incident. And the competent authority, the Portuguese competent authority, had impounded all of this product. And I was asked to advise on uh, what should be done. Is there any way to recover this or retrieve the situation. So we took some s extra samples from these five containers and uh, also asked for records from the vessels and things like this. And what was clear was that one of the vessels had had some very high catch rates of tuna uh, at a certain period uh, when it was fishing and the assumption was that the catch rates were so great that it was too much for them to freeze all at one go so they had to freeze some and leave some on the deck until they could empty their brine tanks of the one batch of fish and then put in the, the next batch and so we took samples from all of the five containers and we realized that the fish with the high histamine levels was actually dotted all the way through these fine five containers. Um, yet the problem was only related to uh, one haul of tuna on one vessel. But when we asked were there any traceability records, we couldn't see any w way the fish were labeled or one container linked to one vessel, no. They'd taken the fish from five vessels, it had all been mixed up in the cold store in Cape Town and then had been stuffed in the containers. So there was absolutely no way that we could identify, there was no traceability, there was no way we could identify which of the fish in these containers was affected. And uh, we knew from our sampling that it was only about 5% uh, of the uh, consignment which was affected. However, we didn't know which 5%. No way of identifying it. Unless you start sampling and testing every fish, which is impossible. So. We, all we could say to the competent authority is we agree, condemn everything and so we sent 95 tons of perfectly good tuna knowingly to the incinerator just because there was 5% mixed in with it which we couldn't identify. Now, if that operator had had a traceability system in place we would have been able to identify which, which of that tuna came from which vessel and we would have been able to save them tens and tens and tens of thousands of, of dollars. So this just shows that if you have in place a, a, a system for traceability uh, you can, uh, it's in the business operator's favor that they can actually limit the damage from uh, food safety incidents. Uh, of course, we get tr better transparency and increased regulatory compliance. Uh, yeah, because we can uh, uh, identify where in the supply chain failures are occurring and focus our efforts on those, uh, on those areas. Uh, it sustains market access. Many buyers in international markets now are very keen to ensure 
that traceability is in place because of the sanitary and IUU certification and you don't get into the market if you don't have traceability systems and uh, we see improved compliance because we get better risk management so in things like uh, monitoring systems uh, when we see a non-compliance we can actually go to the part of the supply chain and the operators which are causing the problems. So these are some of the benefits. We do get indirectly better uh, food safety. Uh, <coughs> it's also potentially a, an important marketing tool. So this is a website which has been around for quite a while. It's a scheme that is operated on the west coast of the US, uh, Fish Tracks and fishermen subscribe to this and their product is labeled through the scheme and what it means is that any uh, consumer buying a fish at retail level can identify the fishing vessel and the fishing vessel operator from the code on the pack. So there is either a little scanner in the supermarket or you can, when you get home, you can put the code into the internet and you can see a picture of the fisherman who caught your fish and all the details about his vessel and, and uh, what the water temperature was that day and uh, all of that information. But it's a marketing tool and people love to know where their food comes from, you know, and therefore they feel more confident when they can actually see uh, some information about the person who was catching that. One of the things I'm, I'm quite surprised is that until now nobody has really caught on to this with fish from developing countries because why not link the fish to the fisherman to the consumer in a, in a traceability system and you know consumers love this and it, it really does work. Uh, we have some standards for traceability, international standards. Uh, there was a project developed by, uh, with EU funding by the Norwegian Institute of Fisheries and Aquaculture. It's called the Trace Fish Standard and they developed uh, uh, three standards which set out uh, uh, systems, I think is the best way to describe them, uh, which define uh, traceability in different circumstances. They defined they had a standard for traceability of farmed fish, for traceability of captured fish, and they also developed a technical data standard uh, which was subsequently adopted by the European Standards Organization as a standard also for application to all foods. So this was the trace food standard. And this technical standard is basically it's a XML, it's a data programming language uh, to allow for electronic interchange of traceability data. So this is where these, these are external traceability systems. So I can use this data standard to define my traceability conditions and then transmit that to my, uh, to my customers who can then uh, incorporate that within their own systems because the data systems are, are compatible and then this can be subsequently read remotely by any operator that has access to the data system. So these are available online under TraceFish and TraceFood and can be downloaded and uh, I think the TraceCore uh, program is you have to purchase but uh, you know these are now commercial operations for implementation of these standards. Uh, we have some other tools such as barcoding, so we see uh, on this can of 
sardines, it has a barcode, it means something in terms of traceability. You can attach barcodes to individual fish, as we've seen here on this, on this salmon, uh, or you can label it up. Uh, and there is a GS1 uh, organization which produces the standards for this barcode so that the coding is uh, uh, standardized so that when you go through a supermarket checkout and it beeps at you, uh, this is what it is reading. And in that data, which is read, there can be all sorts of traceability information in included. So the standards for optical barcodes are, are defined. You can see that where products then have these barcodes, printed on them, it means there's this, I mean there's a lot of alphabet soup in, in all of this, uh, but what it essentially means is that if they do have this barcode on them, there is going to be uh, some linkage to the data within the, the supply chain, which, which in theory should be available to us as, as, as inspectors. And what's also, I, I, one thing I, I failed to mention was that uh, now when we go to the supermarket usually you have a, a loyalty card you know which they scan because you get points or other benefits against that are the records of the purchases uh, that you make so you can imagine how powerful this becomes then in a recall situation you don't have to put it out to the media you just contact directly each individual consumer who bought cans according to that code because that's in their database so you can actually focus the recall on on individual operators uh, and that is the power of, of information and communication technology and how it how it is working very well to improve food safety so this is one of the great advantages where uh, uh, traceability systems can, with, with combined with information technology, can really uh, strengthen the safety of, of our food products. And similarly, uh, we have things like uh, radio frequency uh, ID tags, which essentially can also contain exactly the same information, but which are placed in a product and then scanned automatically. It's just another way of communicating the, the data either from a numerical code or a barcode or it can be communicated in a little device such as this, a chip. This is the same now as you might put in your pet dog or your pet cat or you have in your passport if you have a electronic passport which which contains data and can be read by uh, proximity rather than even optical scanning. And I was just uh, browsing the, the other day and I saw this new shopping system by uh, Amazon, which you've probably got some announcement about as well, because it seems they've just launched it. And you just take a product and put it in your bag and walk out of the store. And, Decrease. decrease yeah yeah it should do it should do uh, because essentially you are <laughs> you can't shoplift because it's reading it as as it goes out and those, that means that you have an RFID tag in every single product which is being read automatically and is being uh, uh, money is being taken out of your account via your your mobile phone uh, so these, these kind of things all improve food safety by improving uh, traceability. So just to say that from the point of view of inspection and control, it is our responsibilities now as inspectors, as competent authorities, uh, to check compliance with traceability requirements in fisheries and, and aquaculture supply chains. <coughs> Uh, we all have probably, 
within our existing legislation a power to require information which we could perha perhaps use to require information about traceability uh, but it is advisable I think in any legal reform process which you might be involved with uh, to ensure that regulations are more specific in this, that there is a specific requirement for traceability and that uh, inspectors are given powers to uh, inspect traceability and that offences are defined such as failure to keep records or making false claims about records, failure to disclose information failure to have a recall or a withdrawal plan or failure to follow valid instructions in other words if a notice has been issued uh, to force a, a recall and to have some uh, inspection of course I think these are all the things that we have mentioned that should be present uh, but you need to have uh, as part of your routine inspection protocol even a checklist and I think we include a checklist in one of the uh, manuals a traceability checklist at the end of the respective manual on traceability where you should check that these various things are in place that there is uh, that the supplier is clearly identifiable that raw material being in reception is being uh, identified by a batch code that lots are separated uh, during transport so if you have a vehicle which is visiting ver various different suppliers to bring you raw material that there is a separation uh, within those within that vehicle so you can I still identify the different suppliers to ensure that coding systems re reflect relevant information uh, ensure separation of batches, division of batches, our combination of batches are properly recorded ensure that final product label codes permit trace back to origin is very instructive to walk into somebody's to a fish processor's final product store before batch and you pick at random some products and say okay tell me about the suppliers of these products and they should be able to consult their records and say yeah this came from fishing vessel so and so on such and such a date uh, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and all of the relevant information of, of that supplier uh, and that, that should be a, a routine part of inspections as well as checking that re recall and withdrawal plans are properly formulated and, uh, and documented and all of the data on suppliers and customs, uh, customers is available so uh, these are some of the, the things that we should be thinking about checking on a routine basis as part of our uh, controls and uh, where business operators have uh, uh, failures shall we say or non-compliances or are not able to show all of these features then uh, we need to be considering what actions should be should be taken okay so that's traceability thank you very much yeah done